So we're going to look at the book of Genesis here in a moment. We're going to talk about a gentleman by the name of Abraham. You all remember Abraham? You guys remember that song in Sunday school? Father Abraham had many sons. You remember that one? That song wore me out. At least, maybe not as a kid, but as an adult that had to do that. All the actions that are involved. But we call him Father Abraham. The father of faith for a reason. He didn't get the name and then he had to live up to it. He lived up to what it meant to be a man of faith. And therefore we called him a father of faith. So in Genesis chapter 17 talks to us about a season that he went through where he questioned God. Have you ever questioned God? Anybody? Well, if we're honest, we'd all have to raise our hand. You know, we question, was that God? Is that God? Is that not? Are you sure? How do I know? How can I be sure? Well, Abraham found himself in this position. He was promised to be the father of many nations, but yet he wasn't seeing anything move. And so it tells us in verse 15 of Genesis 17, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai anymore. Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of a nation's. Uh, Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man a hundred years old? So Abraham's a hundred years old. Anybody here, guys in your 70s, 80s, want to have a new, brand new newborn child? You know, or young? No. Uh, but, but it gets even better. And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Ladies, 60s, 70s, 80s, you want to bear a child? Probably not, right? You don't want to do that. He says, she, that she will bear a child, you know, even though she's 90 years old. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, no. He said, but Sarah, your wife will bear you a son. And you will call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for, uh, for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Uh, it's been a number of years ago, but my wife and I went to Fort Lauderdale, Florida for our anniversary. Uh, we always pick places that are warm, usually have beaches and sand and all that good stuff. And um, there, there's something you need to know about my wife, okay? I think the secret's out, but my wife's a little bit crazy, all right? What I mean by that is simply this. She loves to do crazy things. She loves to parasail. She loves to scale down a little mountain size. She wants to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Who does that kind of stuff? Unless you're in the Army Rangers or something like that. She, she will pay money to jump out of a perfectly good plane when I don't even want to pay money to get in a perfectly safe one. Uh, God paired us together somehow. And I like to think that we balance one another out. She's gotten me, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy things. I like adventure. But my definition of adventure and her definition are completely different. Completely. But she starts rubbing off on me a little bit, you know. But uh, I did go parasailing with her eventually, by the way. Found out, you know, I loved it. Um, when I did go parasailing, that we were the last group, of course, and this was in a different place, but he, he gives the spiel. We're going to set you out there, and in the un unlikely event that the rope snaps, you will gently go down into the water. We will scoop you up and give you a free T-shirt. And they said, any questions? I said, yeah. Do you give out any free shorts? Because if that line snaps, I'm going to need some, <laughs> right? Uh, but here, before we ever did that, we're in Fort Lauderdale, and I, I was having none of it. And they said, uh, we need somebody else to go up with, you know, kind of balance things out, however that works for parasailing. And they said, would you like to go? And I said, nope. And they said, are you sure? We're not even going to charge you. It's free. And I was like, no, no, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to go up there. And I was just struggling with that. And they said, listen to me. They said this line right here. These lines will not snap. You're safe. Now, I don't know about you, but when you put the word snap and safe in the same sentence, I'm not buying it, all right? I, I believed them, but I didn't trust them. That's what it boiled down to. I believed them, but I didn't trust them. I, I used illustrations before with uh, Charles Blondin. He was the tightrope walker that went across Niagara Falls. He'd go back and forth, and everyone was, 
in awe of. Then he'd take a wheelbarrow and he'd go back and forth and like, you can do anything. And he said, I believe I can walk across with somebody in the wheelbarrow. And they said, we believe you can do it. And he said, who's going to jump in? No volunteers. They believed him, but they didn't trust him. And this is where the rubber meets the road for all of us. In a recent poll, 83% of Americans said they believe in God. You know, we can believe, but not necessarily trust. And there's a big difference. When we add trust to belief, that's the whole package of faith right there. And we are called to be people that live a life of faith. That means believing, but it means trusting God as well. God told Abraham he would be the father of many nations. And Abraham said, I'm 100, my wife's 90. I don't see how this can be. But yet he believed. And so the Bible says, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, the fact that he believed. However, when nothing happened for a while, he thought, I need to help God out. Anybody here ever try to help God out? Anybody? Yeah. How did that go for you? Because every time I help God out, it backfires on me. Every time I help God out, it's like everything just shuts down. But, but what God doesn't understand, or at least is what I believe in that moment, is, is that I've got this figured out. And I, I can help him out. But God doesn't need my help. God doesn't need your help. What does he need? He needs me to not only believe him, but to trust in him, even when it seems like it's unlikely that he's, he's answering. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he's not present. As a matter of fact, it's usually in the silence that you experience more of the presence of God. Does that make sense? You may not hear what you want to hear, but you will hear him. And I, I just got to say this, anything that he says or speaks to you is always going to be way better than whatever you or I could come up with. It always will be. Abraham, nothing was happening. He needed to help God out. So he, he convinced, he, he was convinced uh, uh, Ishmael's the way to go. So, you know, they, they had this plan. Here, just sleep with my servant and you can have a child. His name was Ishmael. And um, we got to be very careful because like Abraham, sometimes... We can think, I know God's got a promise for me, but I just need to help him out. I need to push it, progress it a little bit more. I've got to do it my way. And that, gets very, that can be very scary. We can believe, but we're not trusting. We circumvent God's promises. And that's where the problem comes in. And we start calculating, uh, what's the risk? Do I think I can, I can make it? And, and if we're not careful, we can start with God, start thinking, if, if I'm at point A and point B is my goal, maybe I can figure out another way. Let, let me ask it this way. Have you ever watched a football game and at the kickoff, you saw the guy receive the football in his own end zone. He runs up concourse A, out to the parking lot, up the parking lot, down concourse B, grabs a hot dog on the way, you know, comes in that end zone, throwing the ball down, screaming touchdown. Doesn't work that way, does it? Why? because he didn't play within the boundaries that are assigned for football. There are boundaries that are there. There are guidelines that are there. The game is played in this arena. And the moment you step out of it and try to do an end run on God, game over. You know, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna happen. See, when we don't trust God and we take matters into our own hands to fulfill his promises for us, all it's ever gonna bring in our lives is pain. All it's ever going to bring is some frustration. There are still problems today because of Abraham not trusting God to fulfill his promises God's way. There's going to come a time when you and I, we will have to decide whether we trust God to provide for us in his way and in his timing. Otherwise, we'll believe God, but then we'll decide, well, we got to take it over. We got to, we got to help God out because we don't trust that he's going to Bring it to fruition. How many, of, how many of you guys just love God's timing? Well, it's kind of a trick question because we love it when he's answering it now. But have you ever had that when God gives you a promise and it seems like it takes months, years before he answers that? What took you so long? I'll, I'll guarantee you this. When God answers it, you're not going to be worried about how long it took. You're just going to be glad that it's there. You're just going to be glad that you waited upon the Lord. But if you do an end run on God nothing's going to happen. It shuts down the blessing that he wants to bring in your life and in my life. It's not always easy to do it God's way because we have to be more patient. If it was easy to do it God's way, we would all be doing it, but not all of us are. We wouldn't complain or be frustrated, but yet 
I know I've complained and I know I've been frustrated with God because God said, and I'm waiting for the answer. And it just seems like he isn't answering yet. But if I do an end run on God, I can guarantee it's gonna shut down everything that God wants to do, to do in and through my life. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. Abraham tried to do an end run on the Lord. However, God spoke to Abraham again. And this is where he said in verses 16 and 17, he said, um, I'm, gonna give you another, I'm gonna give you a son. Sarah's gonna, she's gonna be pregnant and she's gonna have a baby. And it says, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart. What that means right there, said in his heart, is kind of a way to say it is, is have you ever thought something in your head? You didn't speak it out loud, but you thought it really hard in your head. That, take that phrase right there, said in his heart. He's like, this, this is crazy. How is this going to happen? Will a child be born to a man who's 100 years old and the mom being 90 years old? You see, although Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, when it came down to the wire, Abraham did not trust God. Now, you might say, I, I, I don't know. All the Bible stories I've heard, are you sure you didn't trust them? I'm sure. How do you know that? Because he went into Sarah's maidservant and had a baby. They found another way to make it happen. They found a shortcut. And shortcuts never get you where you need to be in life. It will be very careful if the Lord is speaking to you and you're wanting to move from believing to trusting. If I were to ask you today, and I'm not going to, how many of you believe in God? We don't, amen, you know, how many of you trust him? We want to say amen, but we've got to ask, all I'm asking you to do, I'm not saying you do, I'm not saying you don't. I'm asking you, let's hear what the word of God says and then you can answer for yourself, okay? In your own heart. And if you find anywhere in there where you're like, maybe I'm not trusting as much as I, I thought I was. Maybe I need to trust more. Then just make a decision to do it. There's no shame that comes with this. There's no guilt that comes with this. It's the Holy Spirit saying, I love you so much. I just want you to, 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 to know the truth. I've got a promise for you. I've got a plan for your life. And I want you to lean into that. So don't get so hung up on doing it your way. We can believe God, but not trust him. So watch out for that. Ishmael became the father of the Arab nation. His descendants became the enemies of Israel uh, the rest of their lives. In fact, Israel's enemies were, um, were her half-brother's kids. Uh, cousins were fighting cousins. And there's a family feud that continues to this day. How often do we believe God, but we... We don't trust him. You know, God says he will bless us financially. Okay, do we tithe? Do we trust him with the tithe? Oh, oh, oh that, that's where we're going with this? I'm just saying that the, the word of God says that he's our provider and that we can trust him financially. You see, everything I have, I only have because God allowed me to have it. Can we agree on that? So when God's asking for 10% back of what's rightfully his anyway, I should be happy I still get to keep 90, first of all. Uh, secondly, I shouldn't have a problem releasing that and giving that to God because it's his anyway. You see, if we believe a certain doctor is the best, we go to that one. If we believe a certain mechanic is the best, we take our car to that mechanic. If we believe a certain bank is more trustworthy than others, we invest our money in that bank. Uh, do we check our chairs before we sit down in them? No, we just trust that they're going to hold us. Sometimes I feel or I've been in a place where I have more faith in the chair I'm sitting in than I've actually placed in God. I'm just, it's a reality, you know, and I had to correct that in my heart and in my life. But when you can believe and you can trust, that's the whole package called faith. So for me anyway, speaking for me, it's easy to believe God. It's a little bit harder to trust him. And you'll hear why in just a moment. I do, but just like you, it's easy in church or in conversation to say, I believe in God, I trust God. But when the rubber meets the road and you actually have to put it into action, uh, you, you know, that, that, that's where it all gets lived out. God will start to change things in our hearts and in our lives. And if we're going to receive God's blessings for our future, one of the things we need to do, this is number one. Like I said, I'm just giving you three things. Here's number one. Choose uh, uh, or cooperate in his ways. Cooperate with the ways of God. It's important that we do that. We believe God. We also have to cooperate with God. We have to move beyond belief to trust. As I said, 83% of Americans uh, believe in God. Even the devil believes in God, right? He believes in God. 
There's, no, uh, there's not one demon in the universe that's atheist. Demons aren't atheists. People are. They don't believe in God. They don't trust. We also can believe, but not trust. God's resources and blessings, they, they flow when we begin to believe and when we begin to trust. We know the chair is faithful to hold us that we sit on. We, know, we can know that God is faithful with our lives. So why don't we just rest in that and rely upon him? This is what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6. It's the verse I've always loved. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own what? Yeah. Don't do that. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. It starts, how do I do that? Very beginning, trust. Not just believe, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean upon how smart you are, how good you think you are. Lean not upon your own thinking, understanding. Just acknowledge God and he'll make your path straight. See, it delights heaven when we not only believe God, but we also trust him. The essence of obedience is trust. In fact, disobedience is when we don't trust God is going to come through. And we need to be a people who not only believe God, but we're willing to place our trust in Him. Uh, And that's every area of our life. For our finances, for our dating relationships, for the way that we treat people of the opposite sex. Trust God in everything, in all all your ways, it says. Acknowledge Him and He will make your, your path straight. But we have to do our part. We have to be involved. Sometimes we believe God, but we don't make any moves to demonstrate our faith. And faith is activated by trust. So trust is incredibly important. You know, if we, if we want a good marriage and God asks us to do something, we're going to have to follow through with that and do something with it and trust him. And that's where things come together. Uh, so trust in his ways. If we want to be financially secure and God says give or he says tithe or he says stop spending, uh, are you going to, here's the question, are you going to follow through? Knowing something is good. Doing something with what you know, that's the sweet spot. If you know what is right to do it, then do it. Do it. Follow through with obedience. Have you ever had somebody tell you this? You need to change your attitude. You ever have anybody tell you that? Usually if somebody says that to your face, ding, ding, you know, you're, get, you're getting ready to get into a fight or something like that. But there's times where maybe you've said it to somebody or somebody said it to you. But I, I remember the time when the Holy Spirit spoke that to me. And here's the cool thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak to you and tell you those things in ways that you can receive it. Other people, they tell you, you need to change your attitude. That's like poking a bear, right? You know, see if you can catch me, right? We don't, we don't do that. But the Holy Spirit can show up and say, at least he can say to me, and I, because I know he has on more than one occasion, Jim, you need to change your attitude. Who do you think you are? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I remember now. Why? Did you see what they did? Did you see what they said? Did you? I can do that all day long, and he'll just be like, you need to change your attitude. And I've got a choice. I I can hear him. I can believe that what he said is right. I can believe that what he said is true. But am I going to trust it? How do you know if you trusted it? Because I will act upon it. That's faith. We have to be willing to do that. If we want to be financially secure and God says, give tithe, give, we've got to do that. Whoever, Hosea chapter 14, verse 9 says, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. The ways of the Lord is right. The ways of the Lord is right. When God speaks to us about these things, are we going to listen to him and follow through with what it is that God says? Because listen, sooner or later, you and I are going to have to make another decision. And here it is. Will we keep God's word the same and change our lives to match God's word? Or will we change God's word to match our life? Every single one of us is going to have to make that decision. Are we going to... How many of you know the Word of God will stand forever? Amen? Amen. But I know there's times when I've tried to make the Word of God fit my life instead of me fitting the Word of God. That's a decision we're all going to have to make. The sooner we make the decision, the better. God's Word does not change. It is immutable. It is immovable. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass uh, withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever and ever. And ever, it doesn't say all those evers, I'm adding those in. But it stands forever. 
God is unchangeable. He's immutable. He is the majestic one. Therefore, we are to change to match his word, not change his word to match us. We're not to only believe God, but also we're supposed to trust God. He calls us to trust him. And as we do, he changes us from glory to glory into the image of Christ. That's how it happens. He changes us into the person that he wants us to be. But not only that, but he changes us into the person that we probably have been wanting to be all along and even better. We just have to be willing to trust him. His word is worthy of our trust. His word is worthy of our trust. Remember in the Bible, I'm going to jump over to Matthew chapter 8 for a minute. Do you remember in the Bible there was a centurion that had somebody that was sick and he came to Jesus because he wanted him to be healed? And it just so happened that this centurion trusted Jesus. He asked Jesus to heal his servant and Jesus said he would go and heal him. But the centurion said, no, no, no. He said, listen, I'm not worthy for you to come under the roof of my house. He said, instead, he said, just speak the word. Just speak the word. The centurion knew that Jesus just needed to speak the word and his servant would be healed. And the centurion trusted the word of Jesus. And Jesus, it says, marveled and gave this man one of the highest commendations of the whole New Testament. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. Now when Jesus heard this, the centurion, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such a great faith with anyone in Israel. How many of you would like to have that said about you by Jesus? You know, for him to look you in the eyeball and say, I have not found such a great of faith in Clinton County. We've got to start somewhere, right? Clinton County. We'll work in Iowa next. And you might say, I wish I could be that person. You can be. You can be that kind of a person that becomes a trustworthy type of person, but it requires us to not only believe, but to trust, act upon that. Jesus considered this great faith because this man traveled to see Jesus and said, I want him healed. Jesus said, come on, I'll go with you. Uh, And he said, no, 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 you don't need to. Just speak the word. And the centurion believed and trusted. And then he walked away. Now you gotta remember, he had to walk back to his house. He couldn't text ahead and say, dude, Jesus just gave me the two thumbs up. Is he healed yet? You know, he wasn't following through and putting God to any test or any hoops to jump through. He believed him. And he trusted him. And that's all God's asking of you and me. He says, come to the place where you and I cooperate with the ways of God. Believe in him and trust in him. You know, um, a few months after I gave my heart to the Lord, and I've shared part of this story, but I'll share another part. Uh, A few months after I gave my heart to the Lord, uh, Lisa and I headed for Dallas, Texas. We were going to Bible college. Um, God began to speak to me. He began to speak to us. If I ever go to I or me, it was us. We did, this is something we did together. But he began to speak to us about ministry. And I, I mean, I, the jobs we had at the time were decent. I mean, we weren't making you know, awesome money, but we had jobs and we were living life. And we felt that we were to give up our jobs, quit our jobs. Lisa and I, we packed up. We were heading to Dallas, Texas for Bible college. And we were taking the steps to go into ministry. And I thought, this is crazy. This is crazy. It's just crazy that we're doing this because one minute I'm living in the world, I'm of the world, I'm thinking like the world. Jesus saves me, picks me up, cleans me up, and sends me out. And I said, are you sure you trust me? And that was the wrong question because that's when God said, no, Jim, the question is, do you trust me as your father? And I had to make a choice. It it blew my mind. But I know I was called in to ministry at the age of 14, but something happened between 14 and 22. We don't need to go there today. But I got my heart right with the Lord. And it just goes to show you, by the way, no matter how bad you think you've messed up, you're never so far gone that God doesn't love nor care about you. He's calling every one of us home. He's calling every one of us closer to Him. But that's what we did. We quit our jobs. And... Um, it's just what we heard the Lord speaking. We believe this is what God spoke. Now we're acting upon it. And we packed up our house. We headed to Texas, not even knowing if we were accepted to Bible college. That's crazy. I'm not saying that's the wise thing to do. You know, it's like you're trying to 
arm wrestle God into something, but we just felt so strongly this is what God has us doing. So we packed up everything in our U-Haul. We're heading to Texas. We're making phone calls because it's not like we had the World Wide Web back then and all that stuff. You know, we're trying to call them and say, hey, are we going to be accepted? Because little did they know I'm driving down Interstate 35 heading your direction, right? We stopped in Guthrie, Oklahoma because I could only drive so far. We were tired. We got a hotel. We woke up the next morning and we're, at least I was, frantically calling the school you know, because if we don't have a home in Dallas, I watch cops, okay? And I saw that TV episode. And if we don't have a home, we're in big trouble, right? You know, and I'm kind of panicking. Again, not fully trusting in that moment. And I called and they said, yep, we got you in. You got a place. You're starting school here in just about a week. And so that was one hurdle that we cleared in just trusting the Lord. But then when we got there, we, 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 had to, we, we couldn't um, just do school. And then we had to pay for it as we went. So we worked eight hours a day and then did four hours a weekday at school. And we saw each other, I don't know, we had lunch together. And I saw her when I got home from work and then we went to bed and got up and did it all over again. In that two-year period, I remember having one, maybe two date nights, and that was about it. It was crazy. And, and we had good jobs. She worked at a hotel downtown Dallas. I worked at a hotel up north in Dallas. And we always joked about who had the better hotel, right? Right. The truth is, she had the better hotel. Her hotel is still better to this day. It only got bigger and better. Mine turned into a nursing home, okay? So I took my kids, because in our home, we'd always joke about it. Well, you know, you may have more rooms, but we got better quality staff, you know? So when our kids were with us in Dallas one time, I said, let me show you where I work, you know, acting all cocky and proud. And I drove down Mockingbird Lane to show them where it's at, and I couldn't find it. I'm like, where's it at? And it's because they changed it so much and turned it into a nursing home. So, man, I never heard the end of that with my kids. You know, nice hotel, Dad, you know. No wonder it was such an easy job, you know. And then we went down to stay at her hotel, and they only spiced that thing up like 100 times from what it was back when we were there. But we had good jobs. We had the favor of God. We were working in these hotels. At that time, I was the highest paid engineer at that hotel. Don't be impressed by that. Engineer just means, like, maintenance guy, okay? Um, but I wasn't even really that. I was a glorified babysitter is what I was. But here's the thing they recognized. They loved how I treated people. They said, we can't find anybody else that can handle people and talk to them and treat them that way. And they're like, we don't want you to go. We want you to stay. Lisa's workplace offered her a management position, which would have catapulted her into some higher level management. Uh, I, I don't even know what you'd call it. All I heard was more money. That'd be nice, right? And I, I, I got to tell you, this was a difficult time. We ended our education, and now it's time to go into ministry. Or not. Maybe this is what the Lord brought us down here for. Maybe, maybe we should take these hotel jobs. I mean, we, look at the favor we have. Look at how the people, they love us. And come on, home of the Dallas Cowboys? Come on, somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> but it was just a distraction. And that's where we really had to take not just believing in God, but trusting very seriously. And you work that through in obedience. Obviously, long story short, here we are. And, and we left. And I remember our coworkers, you're really going to do that? You, re you know, I thought that was just a thing. You know, I thought maybe it was just a season. But no, we had to trust in the Lord and we had to cooperate with his ways. Sometimes cooperating with his ways means having a hard no and facing some confrontation. And sometimes cooperating with his ways is, is trickier because you have all this favor from the world, but God's not involved in it at all. And you got to know the difference. It's the difference between walking and trust. Trust is huge. Not just trusting in the Lord. It's about trusting in others. And that's where it gets kind of shaky, right? In our home, trust is a huge thing. Uh, not just the word trust, but when my son was seven, somewhere around there, uh, he was sick and I took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, sorry, my brain's kind of, I got monkeys jumping around in there too. He, was, he had, I think it was double pneumonia. And um, the doctor said, can you come on out to the hallway? And so I went out to the hallway and he said, listen, your son's really sick. And he said, so I got two options. Option number one is he gets four shots in his legs today. I said, what's option two? He said, he goes to the hospital. And I said, option number one, please and thank you, right? You know, because I didn't want him in a hospital, but I went back in to talk to my son now. And I said, hey, Seth. I said, come here, bud. I want to talk to you. I said, do you trust me? And he said, no. 
He's a funny, he's a hoot, man. I said, Seth, you know I love you. He's like, just tell me, Dad. I said, listen, you have to get some shots. Shots? Some? How, how many are we talking? I was like, four. I know, Dad, I can't do four shots. He just went into a pile of crying, right? You remember, he's seven years old. I'm not very fond of needles myself, but I said, Seth, you got to understand, I would, do you trust me? I would take these shots for you if I could. I'd go in the hospital for you if I could. I'd lay down my life for you if I could, but this is on you. you, you you're sick, your body needs this, and if not, you have to go to the hospital. I'll go to the hospital. I'll go to the hospital. I said, no, you won't, because <laughs> I'm thinking all the bills and all that. I said, listen, you got to trust me, but I think the most humorous part was, before I told him about the shots, is I said, uh, I love you, buddy. And it, he says, Dad, am I going to die? He meant it with all his heart. And I grabbed him and I said, oh, buddy, no, 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 no. And I held him and I just patted his back. I said, you're not going to die. You're just going to wish you were dead. <laughs> and he goes, what? And that's when I told him about the shots. And um, I said, I'm going to give you my fingers. Do you trust me? He's like, Dad, I don't want to trust you. I said, I know, I get it. I really do, bud. But I'm asking, you know I wouldn't do this if it wasn't necessary. He's like, yeah, I know. He said, so I'm going to give you my fingers, and two nurses are going to come in, and they're going to, bam, and they're going to take another one, bam, and get it done real quick. Okay, I said, you grab my fingers, and you squeeze them as hard as you want, but just look at me. So, you know, if Seth were laying there, I laid my arm over him, put my fingers there, and because uh, he didn't want to see it. I said, just squeeze. I wish I wouldn't have told him that. He about ripped the fingers off my hand, right? And, uh, but they just, you know, he, he tensed up, he's ready for it. And they, bap, bap, they got him. And he's like, are they done yet? And I'm like, yeah, quit grunting or you're going to have another problem, you know. Uh, and it was over. But it was about trust. And we, we, we leapt from that. There was this situation in middle school where something happened and he got involved in something. And I said, we're done with that. You're not doing that anymore. But dad, I want to do that. I said, listen to me. Do, do you trust me? Yeah, dad, you know I trust you. I said, then not only do I need you to trust me, I need you to do what I'm saying. That will show me that you trust me. All right. He didn't like it. He didn't want to do it. But the reality is, is he had to make a decision that day whether he was going to trust me. And I thought, how great is it to have a relationship with my boy that's developing where he trusts his father? And then I stopped and heard the Holy Spirit say, yeah, it'd be really cool if I had one of those too. <laughs> he didn't say it that harsh. But I just thought, can I say the same of my father God that I trust him just impeccably? I just... I'm willing to surrender. I, I hope I am. I hope I am. I, I don't want to say that I've arrived or I'm some guru. At, I, I, I'm, I'm a work in progress, just like you. We all are. And the question is, will we trust God? Cooperate with his ways. Here's number two. Go by what you know, not by how you feel. When you're going through life and believing in God and learning to trust in him, go by what you know, or, Go by what you know, not by how you feel. Remember that song? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. <laughs> right? Because it's not all, feelings are good. Don't get me wrong. I, we like to experience joy and happiness and, you know, it just all of those things are good. We don't like the depression and angry and mad and sad and we don't like all those, but they're all a gift that God gives to us. But he says, they're a gift that I give to you so that you know which way is up. So you know what direction to go in life, but not to control. You don't make decisions. You, you live life believing in God and trusting in, in him by what you know, what the word of God is speaking to you, not by your feelings. Don't let your feelings dictate or lead you. They're, they're there for you. They're a part of who you are, but they're, they're not the end all be all. Abraham learned this. This is what made him the father of our faith. God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. Abraham must have learned something about trust that day and not just believing in God because when push came to shove, he learned to believe and trust. And Genesis 22.3 says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and he took Isaac, his son, and he went to the place which God had told him. Of course, God intervened. If you read a little further in the Bible and everything was fine, but God gave Isaac back to him and blessed him indeed. And Abraham understood something about the importance of trust in that moment. And he went forth with it. And that is why God says, you have to trust my word. You have to trust my word. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. 
um, says this, he who gives attention to the word will find good. And blessed is he who what? Trust. Trust. Not just believes in the Lord, but who trusts in the Lord. God is our architect. Can we agree on that? He's our creator. He's the engineer of our lives. He knows how life is supposed to go the best. He knows what is best for our dating relationships. If we do it God's way, we will get the blessings of God. Here's what it boils down to. If you want Bible blessings, you have to do it the Bible way. That's what it boils down to. You want Bible blessings, do it the Bible way. And you'll get them. Can I get them any other way? No. You want Bible blessings, do it the Bible way. The, there, there's options because he's going to give us free choice, of course. We get to choose whether to, to accept that and walk in that or not. But he will always give us the ability to choose and trust in the Lord. Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. So many, so many believe in God, but only a few trust him. And there's a lot of options out there. Uh, there was a story of a, a, a pilot. He was an acrobat, not an acrobat, aero, aero. He does loop-de-loops and all that stuff. I forgot the name of it. Just left my head. But he would take this plane out, and he was a master at it. He'd flip around, fly upside down, do these loops, do these spins. And, uh, you know, he had the best of the best equipment. And he was out there one day flying above the clouds. But what he didn't know was there was a very dense fog that moved in underneath of those clouds. So when he came out of the clouds, he, well, first of all, he might not know when he came out of the clouds, when, when it's cloud, when it's fog. But bottom line, he couldn't see. And as he started to come down below the clouds and into the fog, he radioed to the tower and said, there's a problem. And they said, what's the problem? And he said, I can't tell which way's up. And they said, what do your instruments say? And he said, my instruments say that I'm upside down, but I'm pretty sure I'm right side up. And they said, trust your instruments. And he said, I don't know. I've been flying for years. I've done it. I, I, I know the air. I know flight. I get all of this, but something just doesn't feel right. And they said, you are coming into the landing strip. Turn your plane right side up and trust in your instruments. And as soon as he did, all of a sudden the tarmac opened up and he was able to land safely. There's going to be times in life where you may say, I've got a lot of experience. I've been to church for 20 years. I've memorized a lot of Bible verses. I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that, you know, you've been involved in Bible studies. I've got relationship with people in the church. But all of a sudden, we can get lost in the fog sometime. And the question is not just, do you believe in God, but do you trust him? How do I know that I'm trusting God? Because when you radio the tower and he says, flip your plane, you flip it. You simply obey. But it's going to be up to us whether we'll do that or not. God is the one who has engineered life. And when we're flying in a fog and things seem upside down, maybe it's because they are. And he just needs to tell us how to write that in our life. It's not about our feelings. Go by what you know, not by what you feel. Have you ever said to your kids, or let's, say, let's say you told them, hey, I want you to go clean your room. And they looked at you and went, eh, I'm not feeling it. How's that going to work? Huh? That's going to happen once maybe, right? And then you're going to correct that. But how many times has God spoken to us? And we've not said it in such a cocky way, but God says, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And we go, I just don't, I'm not feeling it. I don't feel like it. I'm sorry. Did I ask how you were feeling? Maybe I missed something here. You know, we'd say that to our kids. And sometimes God says that to us. It's not about your feelings. You got to go by this understanding that God's word will never leave you or forsake you. It will not fail you. Act by what you know, not by how you feel. And here's number three. Well, what do I do when it's like dark? Like I'm in a place and I just don't know what to do. When it's dark, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. There, there's a phrase we find on every coin in the United States of America. And the phrase is, in God we trust. In God we trust. It comes from Psalms 56.11. It says, in God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? People in the United States believe, but it doesn't mean that they trust. We can believe, but when we start trusting him, that's when all the miracles start taking place. That's when things start popping and happening in our lives. Sometimes it doesn't happen in our time frame. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say, only I'll speak for myself, it hardly ever works in my time frame, but it's always been perfect timing. 
You know what I mean? God knows what He's doing. Can we all say amen to that one? He knows exactly what He's doing. It's just when we don't understand it, it makes us want to question God. How many of you remember a name called Corey Ten Boom? Do you remember that name? Um, Corey Ten Boom, her story was imprinted on my heart. This goes back to the days of uh, war, Jews, Nazis. Um, Corey's family helped Jews escape from the Nazi persecution. And when the Nazis found out that her family had been helping the Jews all along, they killed her father, they killed her mother, and then her sister was imprisoned in one of the concentration camps and then later died in that camp. Well, Corey Tim Boom survived to tell the story, and she wrote a book called The Hiding Place, which was actually later made into a film. If you, if you ever get a, if you're a book reader and ever get a chance to read the book, uh, it's a good book to read. Because in it, she, right, she, she saw many Christians. Here's what she said. She said, I saw many Christians who said they believed in God, but they abandoned their faith when things were getting hard and harsh. Now, she goes on to explain too, this was war. And I believe God understands some of the things, but she said, people did whatever the Nazis told them to do, even though it wasn't right. And Corey said in her book, we can't do that. And so somebody asked her, well, what did you do when things got dark? And she said this, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away your ticket and jump off the train, do you? She said, no, you trust the engineer. And I never forgot that. God is the engineer of our life. He knows exactly what's going on. Nothing takes God by surprise. He sees every nook and cranny, every turn that's coming down the pike. Whether we cooperate with it or not is a different story, but he sees it all. He is the architect. He is the engineer. He is all in all. He's our creator. And he's calling us to trust him. God has designed the best thing, uh, the best things for relationship, for friendship, for businesses. He's calling us to trust him. Trusting him means that we're not only going to believe, but we're going to go with what it is God said. And we're going to live it. I'll close with this. Psalms chapter 125, verse 1. It says, Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. See, we want to be the people who have that kind of a stalwart heart that we're not going to move. Not because we're stubborn, but we're immovable because our belief and our trust is placed in the right thing, in the Word of God. Because God's heart delights. Oh man, His heart just so delights in giving you and me His best. Not just because we're a people that believe in Him, but because we're a people that trust Him. And I want to ask if you do this with me. If you just close your eyes as I close in prayer, because I believe this too. I believe that when God calls us not just to a place of believing him, but to a place of trusting in him, sometimes we can't grab on to what God has until we let go of something that we've been clinging to, that maybe God has been telling us to let go of. There's times in life when God is saying, I want you to surrender. Not surrender so you can look like the person that lost. Not surrender because you're going to be the one giving up something. But surrender because you're going to be the one that's going to gain. You're the one that's going to receive. You're the one that's going to be blessed. But you can't do that with clenched hands. And God cannot fill hands that are full of something else. So I'm asking you today, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? that you need to let go of. Father, I believe you're speaking to many of our hearts here today. And Jesus, for those of us that are hearing you, yeah, I know that's the Holy Spirit, and he's showing me this. Jesus, we're choosing today to surrender that to you because we want more of you. We want to not just say that we believe that there's a God or that we believe in God, but we want to walk in a relationship that trusts you and lives out of obedience because that's what it means to live by faith. So Jesus, forgive us for not seeing it that way before. And today we surrender that to you. So Father, I pray that as we leave this place, that we can leave transformed.
We can leave different. We can leave renewed in our hearts. So we just simply say thank you for that, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We hope that you'll join us again next week, or better yet, join us in person. We are located at 816 13th Avenue North in Clinton, Iowa. Our Sunday morning worship service is at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. If you have any questions about our church or what it means to follow Christ, check us out online at cotod.church. That's C-O-T-O-D dot church. We look forward to hearing from you soon.